Hello, everyone. Welcome to StockSpot's 2023 Annual Investor Webinar. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your lunch hour today on this beautiful sunny day in Sydney to turn up for our Annual Investor Webinar. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah King and I'm Head of Client Care and Advice at StockSpot. Um, for any existing clients, thank you for joining us again. For anyone who's new, it's great to have you with us today. I think this is about the third or fourth year that we've hosted our Annual Investor Webinars. So we hope you have a, a great session today. I will be presenting today along with uh, Chris Breike, our CEO and founder. Um, and yeah, we've got a great session uh, lined up for you. Um, and to kick off, I think 2023, my goodness, what a year it has been of adjusting to new norms, or shall I say new highs. We've seen higher cost of living, higher inflation, higher interest rates. And it's these topics that are really going to set the tone for a lot of what we'll be covering in our session today. So let's kick off. I will pull up today's agenda. We've got four key sessions to get through. So Chris will be starting off with a 2023 general market update, as well as covering the stock spot portfolio performance. Um, he'll also be talking to our new Topaz and Income, Topaz Income and Inflation portfolios. I'll then be sharing some tips on what's ahead for 2024. And of course, we'll leave plenty of time for our interactive Q&A at the end. So um, in terms of the Q&A, you will see the post a chat, post a comment section in the StreamYard chat. Please pop your questions in there. We'll get to them at the end. And I'll just preface that any that we can't get to um, throughout the Q&A session, we'll follow up with you personally afterwards. If you are having any streaming issues, you can click on that little cog uh, in your StreamYard portal and, and move it to the quality to uh, 1080 to improve your streaming quality. And just a reminder that this session will be recorded. If you have to drop off for any reason, we've got about, you know, 45 minutes or so allocated. Don't worry, you'll get a copy of the session afterwards. And just, of course, anything that we cover today is general advice only. We haven't taken into account any of your personal or financial circumstances. So please sit back, relax, enjoy the session. And I'm going to hand over to Chris to cover the first session. Thank you, Sarah. It's uh, nice to have so many clients joining in today. And uh, it was also lovely to meet some of you recently at the ASX Investor Days that we presented at in Melbourne and Brisbane and Sydney over the last month. So really nice to meet some clients in person, which we don't often get to do. Um, as Sarah mentioned, um, the first session I'm going to be hosting today is going to be focused on markets and our portfolio. So I'm going to be going through how markets have performed broadly this year, what's specifically driving the Australian share market and which sectors have been doing well and badly, um, the performance of the asset classes within the stock spot portfolios, and then finally how the portfolios have returned. Um, and then after that, I'm going to be giving a short overview of of the two new portfolios that we recently launched and explaining why we launched them and the sorts of clients we think they might be suitable for. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll get started. Um, so this year, you know, what was very interesting in markets is they basically gave us a mirror image of what happened last year in 2022, 20, uh, only everything was flipped in reverse. So Last year, we saw technology shares plummeting and commodities rising very quickly on the back of inflation. This year, we saw technology shares take the lead again and commodities do poorly. So the tech market, as you can see represented in this chart by the NASDAQ, which is the US big heavy tech index over there, um, was the best performing index in the world so far this year, really driven by seven companies only. So affectionately known as the Magnificent Seven, that is Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, which is Google, NVIDIA, Meta, which is the old Facebook and Microsoft, as well as Tesla. They almost drove all of the returns in the US tech sector and the US share market overall, which is quite fascinating in itself. And they were driven by a couple of factors. One was the strong performance of AI. Um, artificial intelligence has been a hot sector this year, and NVIDIA and businesses like Microsoft have benefited. 
um, but also as interest rate expectations have started to fall in the US, people are a bit more positive about growth stocks like technology companies. So tech has certainly done very well, but unless you own those top seven companies, you underperformed, which explains why a lot of active fund managers have still struggled this year because many of them didn't own those top, top seven stocks in their portfolios. And if you didn't own them, you probably did worse than the index. Um, interestingly, within our IOO, which is our Global 100 ETF, 43% of that ETF is in those seven stocks. So there is a large weighting to those US tech businesses, which has helped that particular ETF in our portfolios do well. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, commodities. Um, commodities did very poorly this year. After a huge year of returns in 2022, oil and other commodities really slipped this year as people became a bit more uh, calm about the inflation prospects for the future. Um, now, commodities were the second worst performing asset class. The worst, as you can see on this chart, was actually Chinese shares. So Chinese shares struggled for a few reasons. One, the strained relationship and the trade relationship, particularly with the US. Um, China has recently dipped from being the biggest trade partner of the US to only the third biggest after Mexico and Canada. And so the US is definitely pulling trade away from China. But as well as that, their economy has just been slowing generally on its own. And the property sector has been a big disappointment in China. So all of those factors contributed to the Chinese share market performing badly. Actually, they had a good first half of the year and there was 25 um, trillion dollars that um, went into US shares over that first period of the year. But all of that money came out towards the end of the year as investors became a bit more concerned about the Chinese economy. Uh, what does this mean going forward? Absolutely nothing. As as uh, you know, our philosophy is at Stockspot, we don't think that the past returns of asset classes really have any bearing on next year. So does it mean you should own more tech and less Chinese equities? Absolutely not, because next year we could see the reverse again. Um, so we don't really use past performance as a driver for our asset mix or what we're recommending to clients, but it is interesting to note which assets have done well and badly. Now, what you'll also notice in the very middle of this chart is Australian shares. So it our market this year hasn't been one of the best performers, but it also hasn't been one of the worst performers. And I want to go into a little detail as to what have driven our market to you know, be in the middle of the pack this year. And what you can see from this table, which is a little bit messy, but let me explain it to you. This is a, a table that shows the top issues faced by Australians. It's a survey done by Ipsos, and it looks at what are the biggest concerns of people. And what you can see is, while health and particularly the COVID concerns have been um, dying off in the distance over the last year or two, what's really been increasing as a concern for Australians has been the cost of living and petrol prices. And we've seen that through lots of different factors. You know, I'm sure a lot of you at home have noticed the costs of a lot of your goods and services rising, whether it's groceries, energy, you know, fuel at the fuel pump, other household expenses. You know, this has been across the board, but it's also seen in other places in Australia, particularly the savings ratio. So the savings ratio looks at how much Aussies are saving relative to their incomes. And the cost of living crisis is really visible because this energy, this uh, income uh, ratio or savings to income ratio has been slipping now for two years in a row. So for eight consecutive quarters, Australians have been saving less and less. We're now down to saving only 1.1% of our gross incomes in Australia, which is low as it's been since 2007. Um, so we're seeing this a little bit at stock spot. Certainly the amount of cl clients topping up their portfolios over the last few months has fallen off a little bit. I expect that's largely driven um, to um, yeah, household expenses increasing and people requiring more of those savings to pay um, for household expenses, for school fees, for groceries and all of those other expenses. Um, going forward, I think it's now on a knife's edge whether the RBA in Australia will need to increase rates once more or whether it's now going to pause and look to potentially cut as early as late next year. Um, the market currently has the RBA pricing potentially one more rate cut or half a rate cut going forward and then, uh, sorry, rate hike going forward and then rate um, cuts as early as December next year or January 2025. But again, no one really knows where interest, interest rates are heading. And if COVID taught us one thing, it's that central banks actually have no idea themselves about where interest rates are going. Really, employment and inflation are going to drive those decisions. And if we continue to see inflation stay high in Australia, it's still close to 5% and 
an uncomfortable region for the RBA, they will be forced to continue to raise interest rates. Whereas if it really comes off quickly next year and we tip our country into recession, that's where they'll have an opportunity to cut. And ironically, that's often when risk assets like shares do well is when the central banks start cutting interest rates um, when economies start to do poorly. So it also doesn't mean you should stop investing if there's a recession because often markets price that in already in advance. And by the time the central banks cut interest rates, it's actually not a bad time to be buying. So that gives you an idea of how Australian shares have performed this year. Um, now let's go into the actual asset classes within the stock swap portfolio, starting with Australian shares. So Australian shares have been up, are up modestly this year, up a very small two and a half percent. What we've seen is dividends have come in quite well in Australia, up at three, three and a half, four percent, depending on what you're investing in. Um, whereas capital gains have uh, have taken away some of that, or have been relatively flat for the year, to end up with that two and a half percent return. So within that, there's lots of sector differences. What we've what we've noticed this year, um, sectors such as consumer discretionary have done well, which is interesting given that people are facing cost of living pressures. They're still going out and spending, spending at their um, groceries, spending on other discretionary purchases and that sector is up up six percent this year um it and um, telecommunications have been even better performers up 17 percent this year on the other side of the spectrum the poor performing sectors in 2023 have been utilities um you know assets like toll roads on the back of higher interest rates haven't done very well Healthcare shares have also done poorly, down 8% for the year, and energy down 11% for the year. Now, I have no idea how fund managers would have correctly predicted all of those in advance. And it goes without saying that most of them have underperformed this year because picking the sectors or underlying shares that do well within a share market within a year is a very difficult task. And it's not something we try and do at Stockspot. Rather, we prefer to spread your money across all the different sectors and all the different companies in the market to give you a wide range of companies and ensure that you do own the winners every year and accept that you're also going to own some companies that do poorly. So that's Australian shares for the year. Let's move on to the global share exposures within the portfolios. And in our core portfolios, we have two global developed market shares or the largest hundred shares in the world, as well as emerging market shares. Now, as I mentioned before, global 100 shares did exceptionally well this year mainly driven by seven companies, which are all big exposures in that ETF. And that's what helped the global 100 ETF rise by over 21% this year. Um, the fact that this ETF is unhedged also helped because the Australian dollar fell. So you got the benefit of tech shares rising and the Aussie dollar falling. With emerging markets, the underlying economies and the underlying share markets didn't do quite as well, um, but they were also helped by the fact that this is an unhedged ETF. And so emerging market shares did better than Australian shares, but not quite as well as global shares this year. Um, what's interesting is despite the fact that Chinese shares, which were a big part of that emerging market ETF, did very badly, the ETF still um, generated a positive return over the last year. Um, and that's because of other um, countries within that ETF like India that actually had quite good performance. Now, we often get asked by clients, why do you still have an allocation to emerging markets despite pretty poor performance over the last few years? Um, as you can see from this chart, Emerging markets haven't actually beaten developed market shares since 2017. So it's a long streak of performance that US and technology has done better than emerging markets. But the reason why we maintain our emerging markets exposure is quite simple. The allocation between different investments in our portfolio are designed to optimize returns for each level of risk over the long run. And we use modern portfolio theory, which is best practice for doing this to determine the optimal allocation to assets including emerging markets, based on expectations around returns, volatility, correlations, and other long-term factors. And we take that into account when building the portfolios. And so we think the current allocation to emerging markets does give you the right balance between long-term risk and return, despite the fact that emerging markets haven't done well for a while. Um, what's interesting is emerging markets have now underperformed US shares to their largest extent in 50 years. So they actually have had a pretty poor streak of performance. And at some point, that will bounce back. Um, but in the meantime, they still provide good diversification benefits in your portfolio. And that's why we think they're still an important part of all of the stock spot portfolios. So moving on to bonds. Um, bonds in Australia, you'll remember for those that joined the webinar last year, had a terrible performance. In fact, it was the worst performance for government bonds in about 70 years as interest rates hiked very quickly around the world. Look, interest rates haven't gone down. Um, 
and they've actually continued to rise in Australia over the last year, but at a reduced rate. And a lot of the rises this year were forecast and therefore bonds haven't done well, but they also haven't done badly this year. Um, they've generated income, but all of that income has been eroded by the capital side falling. So they've basically produced a flat return for the year. Not a great result, um, but we still think bonds provide good diversification benefits in a portfolio if um, in the event we turn into a country that goes into recession, bonds are an asset class you want to own in your portfolio. Um, thankfully, things are ticking along well at the moment, which is why the share exposures are doing pretty well. Um, but at some point, bonds will also uh, hold their ground and do well. The benefit of owning bonds now compared to a few years ago is that they actually generate some income every year. So you're earning about 4.5% in our government bond or our high-grade bond ETF, and that's going to give some extra income to the portfolios that didn't exist in 2020. 20 or 2019 when government bonds didn't pay very much at all. So moving on to the final asset class within our portfolios, which is gold. Um, now, gold is um, you know, an asset class that's interestingly um, influenced by a range of factors, and those factors are often changing. But this year, the factors that we see have driven the strong returns in gold have been central bank buying around the world, the political tension that's happening, you know, particularly in the Middle East, unfortunately, at the moment, but as well in Russia and Ukraine. Um, inflation and the expectations of continued relatively high inflation around the world. And for those investing into Australian dollar gold, the weak Australian dollar has also helped. Um, so more than ever, we still believe that gold has a critical place in portfolios as a stabilizer. And if you think of bonds as a insurance policy for the shares in your portfolio, I would be saying gold is the insurance policy for the bonds in your portfolio. And that's what we've seen over the last three years. Bonds haven't done very well, but gold for three years have had positive returns and that's helped our portfolios do relatively well compared to other diversified portfolios out there. Um, and I've recently done some research into gold comparing the performance of gold to other alternative assets out there. So these days, you'll often read about private credit, hedge funds, venture capital, um, other types, sorts of assets like this that are unlisted, often come with high fees. Um, a lot of uh, people are pushing them at the moment, but based on the research we've done, none of them actually provide the level of portfolio diversification that just owning a bit of gold does. And so that's why we don't believe you need to add any extra complexity to your portfolio for that diversification. Simply owning some gold gives you a great, robust portfolio performance over the long run. You know, we're a bit unusual in that way. We have about a 15% allocation to gold in the portfolios, but it's definitely something we think needs to continue in all of the portfolios going forward. And certainly having a 17% return this year has helped our portfolios do better than a lot of others out there. So that's a summary of the assets within the portfolios. Now I just want to talk about the portfolio returns themselves. Um, now the portfolios over the last year have had a range of returns. Um, that um, vary from 4.7% for the Amethyst portfolio to 6.2% for the Topaz portfolio. And that's really the weighted average of all of the assets within the portfolios. And while that might not seem high in the context of the current bank interest rates, what's really important to keep in mind um, is that the last five-year returns that the portfolios have made, which range from 4.9% to 8.3%, have been in the context of a world where the average interest rate over that period was 1.4%. Um, so all of those portfolios have done better than leaving your money in the bank and earning the cash interest rate over the five years, despite the current um, interest rate being much higher. And that's a question we get from clients at the moment is why would I bother investing at all when the past returns for some of the conservative strategies are around 5%? I can get 5% in term deposits at the moment and some bank accounts. And the answer is that over the long run, the share market has earned a risk premium over the cash rate over different times in the cycle, both low interest rates and high interest rate environments. What we've come from is a low interest rate environment where shares have still done better than that low interest rate, um, but haven't quite generated the long-term high returns. Now we're moving into a higher interest rate environment. And over the long run, you would still expect a diversified portfolio of shares to do better than bonds in that, uh, better, sorry, than cash in that period of time and earn an equity risk premium. And historically in Australia, the premium of investing into shares over cash has been around about 5% per annum on average. And so that's why we still think it's important for those who can invest and have the right time horizon to invest to consider investing rather than leaving your money in the bank because bank interest will get eroded to a large extent by inflation and shares and other assets, risk assets in your portfolio will give you that long-term growth potential that cash won't. 
So moving on to the sustainable portfolios, you know, what we've seen over the last year is our sustainable portfolios, which have a bigger focus on ESG companies, um, companies that are in, investing in or well, invested into more responsible businesses according to the certain rules of those indices. Um, they've done slightly better over one year, largely driven by the tech exposure in those portfolios. So ESG and sustainable portfolios tend to have a higher weighting to technology, which has done well, and a lower weighting to commodities and resources, which have done not as well this year. So that's why these have done better over 12 months. What you'll also notice is over three years, we've actually launched these portfolios for just over three years now. They've done not quite as well as the core portfolios. And that's because over that time horizon, commodities and resources have done a little bit better than technology. So if you are invested into these portfolios, which is, we see a large number of clients doing these days to reflect your personal values and ethics and you know making sure you're investing in a way that aligns with how you feel, um, make sure that you understand that these portfolios do have an exposure to technology that will make them do better or worse depending on how tech's doing and also have a lack of exposure to resources which will do well in periods where resources are underperforming but you might find that if inflation jumps up again and resources share, shares go on the tear these portfolios won't go quite as well. Um, which brings me to another point, and I saw a question earlier from someone talking about their portfolio returns over the last couple of years since 2021, and I think this slide might help answer that question for you um, that you posted earlier. Why have my returns been lower than the returns that you publish in the newsletter and you're talking about here in the webinar? It's a question we get quite often after our newsletter, and so I wanted to develop a bit of a chart to help you understand why that is. And this chart helps to show what the annualized returns are for people investing into stock spot portfolios over different time horizons. So here we've, we've picked our high growth portfolio and we've looked at what your returns would have been if you invested for one year. This is to the end of September, mind you, two years, three years, four years, et cetera. And what you can see is over shorter periods of time, one or two or three years, the timing of when you invested has a huge impact on your annualized return. So those invested for one year, actually for these people in, uh, would have returned about a 13% per annum uh, return. But if you'd invested for two years, you somehow unfortunately picked the peak of 2021, you might have only earned a return of one and a half or two percent per annum, which is a huge difference. Um, and that's just the nature of markets is over the short run, um, the timing of you when you invested has a big impact on your result. But then what you can see is the longer you invested for, if you've invested for five or six or seven years, those returns tend to converge with the long-term returns that we publish. So the lesson really is that over the short run, the timing of when you invest has a bigger impact. Over the long run, your returns are more likely to converge with the long-term returns. For our Topaz portfolio, that's been in the range of seven and a half to 8% per annum over the long run. So if you have only invested for two or three years, it is very normal to not see returns of five, six, 8%. Um, you may be seeing lower returns just because of the timing of when you invested or when you topped up, but stick with it because earning those long term returns does take a bit of patience and a bit of discipline. It doesn't happen immediately. And you can have periods of not quite getting the higher returns that you're expecting, at least for the first few years before you latch on to the long term trend and we'll start to see those returns appear. So it is normal. It's something we're seeing a lot at the moment because we did have a bunch of clients investing in mid-2021. And for those clients, returns are a little bit lower. There are also, of course, some clients that got lucky and invested during the dip that happened in 2020 or 2022 or even this year that are seeing much higher returns. It's really just luck of the draw in the short term. And one strategy we would recommend if you are nervous about investing and then seeing the markets fall in the short run is dollar cost averaging, which is drip feeding your money into the market over a period of six months or so to get an average price over that period and avoid the regret of seeing markets fall in the short run if you think that's going to impact you emotionally. So finally, I wanted to give a quick summary of the two new portfolios that we've launched recently at Stockspot, explain um, why we launched them and some of the reasoning for that, as well as what they're invested into and who they might be suitable for at Stockspot. And the first portfolio I wanted to talk about was our new Stockspot Topaz income portfolio. So we were hearing from a lot of our retired clients, our SMSF clients, and those who have a focus on income generation, that they wanted a bit more income in their high growth portfolios. These are typically people that still had an investment horizon of you know, six, seven, 10 years. So they were not conservative investors, but they wanted a broader proportion of income in their portfolios. And that's who this portfolio is really designed for. Those who want a slightly higher 
distribution yield and are happy to accept a slightly lower capital growth component. Because what we know over the long run is if you get a little bit more on one side of the equation, the capital growth side of the equation, you're going to give up on the dividend side and vice versa. So there is a bit of give and take with this. What we've tried to do is find a portfolio that gives about 1% a year more income than the traditional Topaz portfolio, but you're not taking a lot more risk to achieve it, although you will expect to earn a less on the capital side. So this portfolio does generate a bit more income. The fees are slightly higher. These aren't our fees. These are the underlying ETF fees, which are about 0.1% higher. So in the scheme of things, they're still pretty low cost when you compare to other products out there. But um, that's just to get exposure to some of these higher dividend paying ETFs. Um, if we have a look at really why we didn't choose to invest in even higher dividends than this, I think this slide is a nice summary of that. What I've wanted to show here is the Vanguard high yield dividend ETF that is within these portfolios and compare them to a range of even higher dividend products that we see advertised out there that have quite attractive dividend yields. So you can see here, on the history, historical distribution yield column, some of these ETFs have had yields as high as seven or eight or 9% per annum. We avoid these ETFs and the reason is simple. What you get in one side of the equation on the dividend side, you lose on the capital side or more. And what you can see in the total returns column here is the very simple Vanguard ETF that we recommend has done much better on a total return basis compared to some of these high yield ETFs. Partly that's due to lower fees and partly it's due to the fact that it's this ETF still has exposure to capital growth, whereas these other ETFs do not. So we would suggest if you are looking at high dividend products out there, just to be very cautious that sometimes the yield can get dressed up at the expense of capital growth opportunities. And that's why within our portfolio, we've tried to have a nice balance of both. You can see here the underlying exposures within the portfolio. Um, there's a higher weight to higher dividend paying ETFs. We have corporate bonds rather than our regular bonds to also increase the yield of the portfolios. Um, what we see overall is this portfolio provides a pretty similar level of risk to the Topaz portfolio, slightly higher, but pretty similar, um, but provides a higher level of income versus capital growth. So for those particularly where um, you're in a low tax environment and you think that it makes more sense to have higher income in your portfolios, it might be one you want to consider. So the next portfolio I wanted to talk about um, is the inflation portfolio we recently launched. So it's the second portfolio in our new portfolio mix, one I'm very excited about. Um, it's also suggested for those with a longer term horizon, but it's not focused on yield, it's in focused on inflation protection. So for those who have a goal to buy something that's influenced by inflation, potentially a property, or want to pay for something in the future that's influenced by inflation, something like school fees, this portfolio might be a good one for you. Over the very long run, I would expect it to do pretty similarly to our regular Topaz portfolio. So I don't think you need to switch to it. But if your goal is to, to save up for something that's more inflation driven, then that's where this one might be better catered for you. Um, in periods where inflation's rising, the assets within this portfolio are going to do better. And in, in periods where inflation is falling, you would expect the assets to do a little bit worse. Um, that's because within this portfolio, as you'll see from this next slide, it's weighted towards assets that have had historically strong performance during periods of inflation. That is commodities, resource shares, precious metals, inflation protected bonds, and also infrastructure. These are all assets that generally have a level of inflation protection built in. And if you look at them back through history, as inflation's rising, they tend to do better. So within this portfolio, you can see we have a higher weighting to resources, commodities, precious metals, infrastructure, as well as inflation protected bonds. You know, we think it still provides a nice balance. It has great diversification across different assets, countries, sectors, currencies, um, but it gives you a better performance, most likely in periods of rising inflation. And that's my summary of the new portfolios. I would love to answer any more questions you have about them after um, after the end of Sarah's session. Uh, but for now, I'm going to hand back over to Sarah, who's going to lead the next session, giving you some ideas of what we think could be ahead for the next year. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. There was so much helpful information there. Um, if you do have questions about the new portfolios, please do not hesitate to reach out to Hannah and myself in the team. We'd love to chat with you. Um, so, I mean, what another year it's been. I don't think we've heard the terms cost of living, inflation, interest rates, mortgage stress, 
rental crisis, the list goes on and on as much as we have in 2023. But amidst all of this uncertainty, as Chris pointed out, all of the assets in the stock swap portfolios have been up, even if by just a little bit throughout 2023. And I think this goes to show that despite such strong economic headwinds, um, that there can be positivity in markets and more so shows the benefit of staying invested during uncertain times. So in my session today, I am going to be covering some insights on, on what's ahead for 2024, looking at some key themes that we're likely to hear about in the media uh, continually over the course of the year. But in true Stockspot style, um, I'm not going to predict. I think we know that uh, what lies ahead is often uh, plagued with problems, and we've seen this more often than not over the past few years. But looking ahead to 2024, I think there are definitely some key thematics that we'll hear as I mentioned, cost of living. I think these uh, pressures are set to continue. 2023 was certainly the year of coming to terms with higher costs in pretty much everything. Our mortgages, our rents, utilities, food, petrol, clothing, insurances. I couldn't believe it when I got my CTP insurance quote this year and it had gone up by a massive 75%. So cosy living, can you believe it? That was actually the 2023 Macquarie Dictionary Word of the Year. This is a colloquial pun for cost of living crisis. It's something we're all talking about. We're all facing this reality. Um, so I think we'll expect to hear more of it. A basket of goods has gone up by a big 16.4% over the last three years. And I think a lot of that would have happened throughout 2023. Some of our mortgages have doubled, our rents have increased. I just got my third rental increase in maybe the last two and a half years. I can't believe it. But I think if anything, 2024 can be a year that we can plan for these high costs. We know they're here. We know they're staying around. So what can we do to cut costs? Where can we cut back on spending? What can we negotiate with our service providers so that we can increase our our savings buffers. Persistent inflation and higher interest rates. Now, I think we hear about this every single day in the news. The cash rate is now at about 4.35%. This time last year, it was around 3.1%. Um, and, you know, the last rate hike was the 13th rate hike since May 2022. We've currently got inflation sitting at around 4.9%. Now, that is still above the target band uh, that the RBA would like of 2 to 3%. However, it has come down significantly from around about the 8% high we saw this time last year. Um, so whether we'll see more rate rises uh, early in the new year, there has been a pause for December, January. I think it will depend how much we go out and spend over Christmas and through January on holidays. Um, but the, as Chris mentioned, we may see rates coming down towards the latter part of last year. But it's fair to assume that RBA will be doing whatever is necessary to get inflation back down to that target band. Um, when we're looking at savings rates, they have gone up. Um, but when we look, look at how high inflation still is, you know, inflation is still a drag on the real return. So that's your interest rates that you're getting at the bank adjusted for inflation. For a lot of this period, they have still been negative. And I'm going to talk to that a little bit more um, in more detail in another slide. And look, we're still hearing talks of a, a bigger recession coming. They've been spoken about for years now. I think I've covered this in the last few webinars that we've done. And look, if a recession does come, uh, how prolonged, how severe it will be, we don't know. If anything, as Chris also mentioned, it can be a positive thing for a lot of the assets in the stock spot portfolios, particularly bonds and shares. Uh, so lots of things there, but really things that shouldn't sway you from your investment plan and important to block out the noise and stay focused on your sensible investment plan. Undeniably, we've got continued geopolitical risks and, and the, you know, deglobalization effect. Um, this is a top concern for investors globally. We've had the unfortunate turn of events with the Israel-Hamas conflict, you know, sending shockwaves through markets, the continued Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, we're also seeing China-US trade relations that have been somewhat strained, although easing somewhat with Australia. So I think it's fair to expect that we will continue to see uh, potential market volatility off the back of geopolitical events. And then finally, property. I know that a lot of us love property. Uh, we're investing in property. We're property owners. Um, 2023 was such a surprise for the property market. This time last year, there were big predictions about this crash that was coming. The fixed rate mortgage cliff uh, was here and it would lead to a lot of distressed sellers coming to the market. That didn't eventuate. In fact, banks are really quite comfortable with their loan books. Uh, they don't have many customers with bigger ears. If anything, they're trying to help any of their customers who might be in strife. 
Um, so that has led to um, price rises in 2023, which came as a big shock. But look, 2024 could go either way. Uh, it really depends on supply versus demand. We know that there has been a very tight supply of new listings, new dwellings coming to market, uh, but we are seeing increased demand through increased population growth, immigration and you know, even even renters are now looking to go and potentially buy because they're seeing it as a more cost effective option. So what happens in property markets really will be driven by supply. What happens with interest rates, whether they're cut and that helps with borrowing capacities of individuals and increases appetite for property, as well as the unemployment rate. If anything, if rates fall, we might see a more modest rise in property prices next year. So uh, continuing on with this uh, theme of uh, saving versus investing and a thematic of uh, higher interest rates, a very common question we are getting asked by clients is, Sarah, you know, I'm getting 5% in my term deposit or in my high interest savings account. Why should I invest or should I move to cash? And I wanted to include this slide because it's a really powerful one to show the performance of cash over the long term. And this is looking at the last pretty much 100 years versus other asset classes, things like bonds, residential property and Australian shares. Now, cash is that dark blue line there. And you can see over the long term, it significantly underform, underperforms other asset classes. Not only are you paying tax at your marginal rate on any interest that you're earning, but there is also this silent tax that eats away at your return and this is inflation and so much of what we've been talking about today. Your money just doesn't uh, keep up with inflation, so it's losing its purchasing power in the future. So the reason why we want to invest is because it's helping our money to grow ahead of inflation so that we can reach our goals in the future and afford the things we want to buy. We look at the return on the Australian share market. It's been around, you know, nine to 10 percent over the last over the last century. Um, our portfolios give you a mix of assets that are designed to help your money outgrow inflation. I've also been asked, you know, Sarah, should I be moving to cash? I'm a bit nervous about markets at the moment. You know, that is a tricky one. You don't want to be selling down your portfolio at a time when it, you know, you're seeing temporary losses. The moment you sell, you are actually locking those in. If you sit tight, it means that you will be in the market to enjoy that recovery when it comes. Um, the other thing with moving to cash can also then mean that you sit on the sidelines in cash and get the timing of getting back into the market quite wrong, or you, you don't get back into the market at all, or you miss some of the best days. And we know through 2020 that they come around very, very quickly, and they can drive a lot of your returns in any given year. So um, remember, money in cash is perfect for your shorter term goals. We've actually got the stock spot savings option available in your dashboard to cater to those short term goals. If you haven't activated, I'd recommend jumping into to your dashboard and having a look. Um, and your portfolios are designed for that long term wealth accumulation. A lot of you are investing for five to seven to 10 years or more. So continue topping up, stick with your strategy, you're well diversified. And that is how we're helping to manage risk um, with, with through being diversified and owning a mix of different assets in your portfolio. And I think this next slide is really, really uh, great to, to point to that and shows diversification in action. It's a bit of a busy slide, but you know, in a technical term, this is a, a quilt. It looks a bit like a patchwork quilt. It's got lots of different colored squares. Uh, the different squares represent each of the assets in the stock spot model portfolios, your Aussie shares, gold, emerging markets, developed markets, and bonds. Um, if you look at the top line, it's actually they're the top performers in any given year and we're looking back all the way to 2013 when we started tracking the portfolios and all the way down to the bottom is the bottom performer in any given year. If you cast your eye to that top line, you can see it's pretty random. You know, last year's winner isn't necessarily going to be next year's winner. Um, you can also see, you know, for the last four years or so, it's alternated between global shares and gold. And I think this is a really powerful one to the point to the benefit of owning gold in your portfolio. We have had more uncertain markets and it really shows that gold is that ballast in your portfolio when other assets may be underperforming. Another good one to look at is the deep green square. This is your Australian shares. In most years, they have been pretty strong performers. Now, our portfolios do have a higher allocation to Aussie shares. They pay franking credits, but they are a strong, reliable source of returns in most years. Um, 
Similarly, bonds, they're the brown squares. Looking back to 2013, there's really only been two years or one where, where bonds are down. So again, that important level of defense in the portfolio. I was reading some research the other day that said, you know, the yield that you're now getting uh, on bonds, you know, re investing that and the compounding effect of that over the years will more than outweigh um, those temporary price falls that you're seeing at the moment. Emerging market shares as well, that's another one which Chris spoke to. If you look to 2016, 2017, emerging markets were the best performing shares or asset class. That's when we were in a very high growth, low inflation environment. So as we move through different cycles, we're going to see different asset classes perform differently. In some years, there'll be ones that are doing well, others that may not be doing as well, but that's exactly what you want when you're diversified. You have assets that counterbalance one another. Now, also within your asset classes, remember you've got broad index ETFs. We're not picking individual shares. You've literally got exposure to hundreds of them covering different regions, countries, and sectors. So again, we're helping you to reduce risk through having really, really broad diversification. On top of that, keeping your costs low through the choice of assets in your portfolio. Now to finish, I know we're running out of time. We'd like to get over to QA. Just some very quick tips for staying ahead in 2024. Definitely build up your cash buffer, have your emergency fund, three to six months worth of expenses. If, you, if you're building way up to that, at least a few, I know it can be hard to get that amount of savings together. Make sure your money's in a high interest savings account. If not, you can always park it in stock spot savings. Definitely look at reducing high interest debt. You know, the rates you'd be paying on credit cards and other personal loans at the moment will have gone up significantly with the rate rises we've had over the last 12 to 18 months. And again, you know, if you're feeling nervous, stick with your strategy stay diversified. We know that passive buy and hold uh, approach to investing uh, does lead to good results. Our optimised rebalancing will ensure that we're locking in some profits for you, managing risk when we need to along the way. So sit tight and then that feeds into the next thing, dollar cost average if you can. If you've, even if you've got a smaller top up plan this year, continue to top up. Try not to time the market. Dollar cost averaging is the best way to, to avoid that. You've all got flexibility with your top ups, whether you want to do it daily, weekly, monthly. Um, so keep it up. Um, it will only benefit you. And of course, finally, speak with us. Hannah and I are here to chat to you anytime. We'd love to speak with more of you throughout 2024. Um, even, you know, for the latter part of the year, you can reach us through phone, chat, email. If you've got questions around existing investments and you'd like us to assess them, you can reach out to us for a portfolio review. If you've got simple questions around your portfolio, a dollar cost averaging plan, please get in touch. We would love to chat with you. So there's been a lot of information and we're now going to um, click over to our Q&A time and Chris will come back to the room and join us for this session. Um, thank you so much for submitting all of your questions um, and we'll, we'll crack on with those um, now. Great. So the first question is a long one from Martin. I have a question on the stock spot investment strategy. I'm interested in simply maximizing risk weighted returns. Some large super funds constantly talk about tendentious public policy matters like the environment and housing, which complicate investment strategy. How does stock spot avoid this complication and potential confusion in its strategy? Um, good question, Martin. So, I mean, as a business, we don't get too involved in public policy discussions. I know there's a lot of discussion in super at the moment around social housing and whether super funds should have some part to play in that. I think there's also some pushback from super funds who have made the same point that you have, that really their chief concern is the returns and the outcomes of their members. And they don't really have a, a social, uh, you know, a, a cause at the same time. And it's really the government's responsibility to do that. So, no, we don't take... Um, part in those sort of discussions. However, we, where we have, you know, been involved is in discussions around super funds themselves and the measurement of super fund performance. So we were very positive when the government a couple of years ago came out with a performance test um, to measure the performance of default super funds, because what we notice is so many super funds that are taking active bets on asset classes or stock picking underperform a simple ETF style investment or index fund. You know, we measured at something like 90% of super funds underperform that measure. So we thought it was great when the government came out with their own performance test, similar to our own fat cat funds report, which we'd been putting out for 10 years. Sadly, I saw in the news over the last week, 
that a lot of the big super funds have been lobbying the government to reduce that performance test or remove it entirely, which I would see as a very negative um, thing for investors and members of super funds, because ultimately super funds need to be benchmarked to simply the investment returns they could be uh, getting by investing in the broad market index. And if they're not achieving that, they shouldn't be running the member money at themselves. And so I would be saying that um, a place where we will continue to lobby government is to make sure super funds are held accountable for their performance to members, because as you point out, that's the most important thing. Uh, so next question from Judy, when will the stocks, when, when will Stockspot launch a retail super product? Um, Judy, it's a question we get from a lot of our clients all the time and something I've been thinking about for many years. In fact, when I started, so I originally thought it would make sense to be a super product, but as you know, and probably a lot of you there know, it's a very highly regulated industry and difficult to get into. Um, that said, we've been working very hard over the last two or three years to build a, a super um, option. We're getting quite close and I think we'll be able to launch it next year. You know, we haven't tried to cut corners and we've made sure that when we are launching a super product, it's a great long-term product that can give our clients a, a long-term um, pension strategy. Um, so we've, we've been very cautious about not being too quick on this. We want to make sure it's a great um, portfolio strategy, you know, meets all of our investing philosophies of low cost, diversified, transparent, easy to use, great customer service. So look out for it. Um, next year, we're hoping to get something out there, Judy. Thank you, Peter. So your question is, is it possible to open multiple children's investment accounts under one account? Yes, Peter, the answer to that is yes. So what you would do inside your dashboard, if you've already got an account that's open, we have our multi-account feature available. So when you log into your dashboard, that's the web version, you'll navigate to the top left-hand corner and you'll see that there's a circle with a little arrow in it. If you click on that, and expand it out, you'll see the option to add another account, step through, select kids, and you can then go and do that multiple times and set up an account, whether you've got one, two, three, or four children, we'll send you individual cash account details for each of those accounts, and you can get started uh, investing for each of your kids. Thanks for the question. All right, question from Andrew. Hi guys, is the Topaz income portfolio suitable for building a portfolio over the next 10 years, even if you're not planning retirement? Uh, personally, you feel comfortable with that approach or is the standard Topaz more suitable? Yep, look, Andrew, in all honesty, this comes down to your personal goals of whether you're looking to generate more income versus capital growth. Both the Topaz portfolios, the model and the income, are designed for longer term. So as Chris mentioned, uh, the income portfolio is popular in for our you know, retiree clients who are looking to boost income. If you're still relatively young and you're aiming to you know, maximise capital growth, I would stick with the model portfolio. But I would definitely reach out to Hannah and myself. We've got some great information that we can send you and we can work out if you'd like, uh, if you'd like one or the other. You can also have two available if you like as well. So a, a question from Vanessa, uh, on the topic of ESG, does Stockspot have its own ESG approach and or community investment approach, such a great opportunity to make an impact and build a great community of clients? Um, so Vanessa, we launched our um, sustainable portfolios just over three years ago now in mid 2020. Um, before we actually launched those portfolios, um, something we spent a lot of time doing is actually surveying our clients and understanding, you know, what was important to them. Uh, because as you rightly point out, that different businesses have different ESG approaches and what is um, sustainable or ethical to one person may not be the same for someone else. And so there is no kind of consistent definitions across the industry. And even, you know, based on different people's belief systems, ESG means different things. We actually use the results of our client survey to determine what were the sorts of underlying investments we thought were most appropriate for those portfolios. Portfolios. Now, interestingly, when we did those surveys, um, clients told us that the E in ESG was by far the most important to them. Um, so environmental factors, finding companies that have lower carbon emissions, you know, both um, their, um, you know, initial carbon emissions, but then downstream emissions were important. So they were factors that we heavily weighted when determining our methodology. And you'll see that within our portfolio, the ESG focused ETFs we use, we're only using from the, them for the share part of the portfolio at the moment, are um, quite heavy on the environment 
environmental factors relative to some of um, some of the others out there that are a bit more lenient on the factors. And so they have quite a lot of weight towards that. Um, what that does mean is that their performance tends to diverge a little bit more to the index portfolio because the underlying sector exposures are quite different. There are other ETFs out there that have a more similar performance to the market, but that's because they don't re remove, for instance, a lot of the fossil fuel uh, producing companies from their portfolios. So the answer to your question is yes, we did survey clients, environmental factors had a, a bigger priority for clients, and that's why we've weighted them more in our portfolios. Um, so a question from Ian now, um, hi, would you consider adding a resources ETF like OZR to themes? So um, as you probably saw on the slide, Ian, OZR is the resource exposure within our new inflation portfolio, um, as well as our income portfolio, because resource shares at the moment also provide great dividends in Australia. Um, would we consider adding it as a theme? Absolutely, yes. So for those who don't know, we currently offer clients who are investing over $50,000, a range of about 20 different um, more specific theme ETFs, which you can include in your portfolio, um, up to an allocation of around 20%. Uh, you select them, we risk manage them for you and do all of the rebalancing and tax reporting. Um, we have a suite of about 20, but we're always reviewing the universe of ETFs out there to see which other ones we think would be appropriate for adding. Now, nowadays in Australia, there are over 250 different ETFs available. So there's a lot of them, but you have to be a little bit careful because there's also quite a few that are shutting down because they're not getting critical mass and growing enough. So we're cautious to add too many themes in there. But that said, some of those new ETFs that we have already in the inflation and income portfolios, we are planning at some point to add them as theme options as well for those who want to maintain their existing portfolios, but still get a bit more, for instance, resource exposure, as you've mentioned. Question from Janice here. So can I combine a personal account with an SMSF account to lower fees across investments? Janice, yes, you can. All you need to do is reach out to our team. If you're currently logging into accounts separately, we can help link those for you so that if it does your combined balance then tips you into a fee tier such as platinum or diamond, you will then get the benefit of that fee tier, that reduced fee tier across both of your accounts. So reach out to us and we can definitely help that um, help you with that. No problem at all. All righty, a question from Enrico. Um, is continuous DCA beneficial in the long run? Very good question, Enrico. Um, look, it really, it really depends. I mean, DCA, um, I wouldn't say is a great strategy if you're doing it over multiple years. Ideally, having you know a, a time frame of six to twelve months um, of having your money in the market can be beneficial. I mean, for some people, it may even be sooner. But the more that you're dragging it out, particularly if you're working closer to your goal, it can actually um, be unbeneficial. And so, there's research to suggest that. Popping your money in as a lump sum can outperform dollar cost averaging, but you have to be very comfortable with that. And often a dollar cost averaging strategy is around minimizing a sense of regret that if you pop money in on day one and there was a market fall tomorrow, um, you're not going to feel great. So give us a call, chat to our team, and we can have a look at you know how much money you've got, what your DCA strategy might want to look like, and work with you on tailoring that with you. And I think, Enrico, that also would be dependent on if that money is money you're earning in the future. So I think Sarah's example is if you have a lump sum that you could invest now, we don't think spreading it out over many, many years makes a lot of sense. But it is, if it is money out of your salary or money you're earning that your dollar cost average, um, averaging, that does make sense over the long run to constantly drip feed savings that you have into the market. Um, Cool. Question from Aaron. How do I select themed ETFs? So this is, yep, Stockspot themes. These are available to clients uh, investing 50K or more. So Aaron, what you'll see, if your portfolio is already over 50K, you will have that option available to you inside your dashboard. So when you log in, you go to the Your Investments section, navigate to your Stockspot portfolio. And if you scroll down, you'll see a blue button that says Add, Edit Themes. Click on that. You will then see the, the option to select up to three themes in your portfolio. You don't have to do three. You can just do one. Um, save your selection. You'll be prompted to re-sign your agreements, and then we'll go ahead and implement that for you. I think we've got time for one final question, and then I know there's a few others uh, that have been asked, and so we'll try and get back to you individually by email afterwards. Um, this is a question from David. Hi again, David. Um, 
is there any way to avoid the tax issues by starting a kid's account, um, then handing it over to them at the age of 18? Again, quite a common question we get because we've had thousands of kids' accounts and a lot getting set up every week. Um, we, we've seen a lot more parents and grandparents investing for kids, particularly over the last year or two. And I think, you know, the fact that it's very hard for kids these days to buy into property or pay for school fees, it makes a lot of sense compared to leaving money in the bank over the long run. Um, unfortunately, in Australia, there is um, a, a non-beneficial structure for tax for kids in that they can't own shares themselves. You can only own, own, own own shares once you're a little bit older. And so up until that age, um, the parents or grandparents need to own the shares in their name or in a joint name or in a family trust. Um, a family trust can be a good option. And we're seeing that happen with some families where they'll set up a family trust account. Um, the kids can be a beneficiary, but as long as they're not paid from that account until they're um, eligible for better tax rates, that money stays within there. Um, you know, I would suggest if you're thinking of that option to speak to your accountant or tax advisor about whether it's appropriate, because there's also costs involved with running a family trust that don't make a lot of sense if you're only running a small balance. Um, otherwise, um, yes, you would have to invest under your name or a relative's name for the kid on behalf of the kid for those early years, um, build up the growth and capital gains, and then hand over that portfolio at a point in time. We have compared that option though to other options out there like investment bonds where they are um, tax benefited in that the, the fund itself is paying the tax along the way. Unfortunately, with a lot of these other options in Australia, the fees are so high that it erodes the tax benefit. So I think when comparing different options, you need to weigh off the tax side, the fee side, you know, the cost of transferring in them in the future. Um, although it's not perfect, I still think it's a great um, option to help kids get started. I'm, I'm doing it for my two boys and it's a great way to educate them about investing as well. Um, so if you do have tax questions, unfortunately we can't give tax advice, speak to your accountant, but certainly we can um, give you a few options that you can consider if you call our team. Um, well, yeah, thank you very much everyone for joining today. It's great to see so many people still online watching at the end of our webinar. Great to see you all. Uh, we'll be doing more of these next year. And so um, to everyone that's joined and everyone that's watching this afterwards, you know, wishing you a great um, Christmas and break. You know, thank you very much for your support this year. And we look forward to continuing to work with you to grow and, and protect your money next year. Um, feel free to also reach out to me or Sarah personally if you have other questions. And if you want to see other questions that we answer all the time, um, jump onto my YouTube channel because I'm trying to answer client questions all the time on YouTube as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone.